that the reason most people took this class is because they saw MapReduce in the um, in the title and the description. So you've probably been waiting for this part of the class all semester, and hopefully you'll see why uh, eventually by the time we get to the end of it, uh, why why we did the other all the other lectures first. They're they're building on some of these earlier early ideas that we talked about in class. Um, okay, so the um, so the the main things to realize about MapReduce at, at a very high level is that it's the goal is to do extremely massive parallelism, but to make it very easy to use, to make it very easy to program. Well, I'll show some very simple example programs today, and they're very easy to use, and they do they take care of all the parallelism for you. Um, so, and we'll talk a bit about the, the, the history of this. It, as, as I mentioned in a, in a lecture a few weeks ago, that there's this HPC style of parallelism where they're trying to get the highest performance out of the system. Um, the MapReduce was, 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 um, was developed as, as a way to try and look at a different um, at a different ratio of the performance versus the cost. Or really, they were not trying to use the state of our machines, trying to get the most out of some number of machines they had, but to try and get the most computational power for a cost. And so they used cheaper machines, but were able to get, you know, uh, scale them up more and make them more resilient. Um, so it, it, it so, so, so it was overall to get a larger um, win, and we'll we'll break that down a little bit. Um, it, it's also less. Um, it's also less. I mean, that was probably bothering you as much as me. Sorry. Um, okay. So it, so it also has some basic assumptions on how the data is stored. Um, and so it's not as general as, as all the other techniques. Um, and it's also a restriction on how the, how the competition can be done. Um, over the course of the next few lectures, we'll actually see that you can loosen some of these assumptions and restrictions. You can, you can take, you know, these, most any problem and map it into here. Now we'll also see whether you'd actually want to do that, whether it makes sense to map any problem into here, but if you're clever about it, um, how you can how you can go about doing it. Um, the, the, but this was really developed to solve certain very specific problems um, within Google, um, certain big computational things that they had to do um, every day that were taking along their cycles, and they realized that it could be extended into other things. And as they found more and more uses to it, they said, well, let's re-specify some of the criteria. So it, the, it, w it was meant to be fairly specific, but then it, um, um, as as people try to use it for more and more things, instead of where in in, in academics people try to fit everything into MapReduce, the inside Google they were saying let's build other tools for these other techniques instead of trying to cram everything in MapReduce. But it builds on a lot of what was learned and discovered in, in building MapReduce. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the hardware. So one of the main distinguishing factors from um, from these HPC style is that often MapReduce or Hadoop is thought of as working on on commodity machines. You would go and find whatever cheap machines you could you, you could buy and you could run this system on them. Um, so this was some numbers I got off the off the internet somewhere. Um, it's hard to verify prices and, and things back in 2003 nowadays, but. So this was an example of if you were running HPC style parallelism, you would try and buy a single box that had eight of these two gigahertz processors, 64 gigs of RAM, eight terabytes of memory, and this would cost about $750,000. This was the state of the art, roughly state of the art at the time. And this was all, it was all, you know, in one box, so the interconnect was very fast, and, and you, you, you ran everything on there. Right. Whereas, as if where what they did inside of Google, they would build a rack of computers instead, um, and this could have 
176 processors um, with with uh, even even more RAM, one um, one gig of RAM per processor, and and about the same storage, um, but for you know roughly one third of the cost. And they looked at these numbers and they said, let's figure out how to get this highly parallel system working on these on these cheaper machines that not all the components are going to be as high. -end. This costs so much because every single part of it was very high end, all the things connecting it together. Because if one processor, one part goes down, you know, you're, usually your whole parallel system had to, had to restart from the beginning. Or you can do some checkpointing things, but these got very messy and very complicated. So the MapReduce was, and a lot of the other systems at Google were meant to take advantage of this cheaper way of buying many more processors. Does that include the cost of networking the processor together? Um, in, I believe that was the cost inside the rack. But these, I, I'm not totally sure. Again, these are numbers I got from the internet, so these are approximate. But I would think for $50,000, even if you did include the cost of wiring them, you could, it would cost less than $50,000 to wire them up and to build some, some some actual metal rack to hold on. Okay, so, um, so before MapReduce, there was one of, the, uh, uh, one of the other kind of lasting things that has come out of this line of work um, is the Google file system. There's an open source version of this, the Hadoop file system, which is basically the same thing. Um, and so the, the idea is you stored everything as these key value pairs. So, and this is a very, very general format, but it does not have, a, it does not have a lot of structure. You need to know what the, what the data is, but you're not. So, this is as opposed to like a relational database where you have every, where there's a lot more structure in the data. This is very general. You just have some sort of key, and then you have all the actual data stored in these values. So, you can think of just a, whole, a lot of different things can be stored this way, right? If you have logs, it's a log ID, and this is the actual whatever the log is. It could be um, the key could be the web address, and then the value could be the HTML, the upcoming links, everything you need to store about that particular web page. Right? Are this considered a file system? Is, this is to me more like a key value store. Well, the, this was part of the the. Uh, Kind of the ideas which drove um, uh, which drove how the file system worked, right? Instead of it, instead of trying to store, a, a lot of companies have been using um, like the Cisco database or well, not Cisco, like Oracle database, right? Where there's a lot more structure in the data, and that really restricted how you could build the file system, right? So the the first thing they said is we're not going to have as much structure on our data. We're going to store it in this way that it's a key value pairs. Right? So we're going to have very little structure on the data, just have these keys and these values and store things like this. And so at the, at the very low level, you know, you think of the file, you think of the file as just a key value um, pairs. And then you will also, these files may have a lot of keys and values in them. You're going to block them up into chunks. Okay, so this is the next part of the, the file system. Um, because all the files are just keys and values, you can split up these keys and maybe you could split up the values, but often a key and a value are always in the, you want those to be in the, in the, same, in the same block. And these will be about 64 megabytes. Okay, so, so, so you can set this as a parameter. This was what, what Google was using when they, when back in, in the mid 2000s, and this is still, from what I know, a pretty good size to use. And then they will take each block and they will replicate it some number of times. In many academic settings, like if if we if we've we've got a small like 16 node cluster here, um, we we may only replicate things two times. Uh, but on 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 Google, they say they often replicate things more than that. Um, like at least three times. Um, so each block that they have, they all their files are broken into these blocks, and then these blocks are replicated. And you don't have 
the key thing is you don't store these blocks locally next to each other. Okay, so, so what we learned in um, like these uh, these R efficient algorithms and one of the keys was to generate this locality so you got the important data next to each other. But here you're intentionally storing these blocks, even if they're neighbors to each other in the file, you're not storing them next to each other on the same machine. You're going to distribute them. You're not going to have any replicas of the same block on the same machine. And, and probably if you have blocks next to each other in a file, you probably would not want to store those on the same machine. So you want to kind of disperse these uh, 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 um, across different computers. You, you may, if you have multiple racks, you may want them on the same rack. Um, so, so that if, uh, if you're doing computation on the set, you don't have to communicate off of the rack. Um, so you have some locality, but really not very much locality in these blocks. Okay, so there's, the, the, there's, the, there's more details here in how you can keep these things replicated and distributed. Um, and we'll talk about some, how those work um, with MapReduce, but um, this is, you know, the, the, the main ideas you need to get from the, 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 from the Google file system. Are there variations on this idea for um, replicating data at geographically dispersed sites? So like uh, maybe one copy is kept at the North American Data Center and another copy is kept at the Japan Data Center? Um, so yeah, they'll usually do that, but what they won't always maintain copies is say that, um, so you may not try and keep them completely um, up to date. So if the, the one in North America, it may not have all of the latest stuff that's going on in Japan um, like immediately. It's going to have some, not worry about that so much. It may have some delay, that sort of thing. But you want them to, um, to eventually be consistent. And there's this whole notion of eventual consistency. Um, and there are a lot of system issues with um, we're not really going to touch too much on the the, 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 the distribute across um, the data centers. Um, we'll just we'll mainly think about within one data center, maybe within one rack or some small number. Of things. Uh, but there are there are many other issues when you when you, when you go beyond that. Um, okay, so um, so the, the, this may, may seem strange if you haven't work with some of the stuff that there's actually, you're trying to not have um, a, a lot of locality. Um, but, you know, it, it's, the, there, there's strong reasons for this, right? So, so you get a lot of benefits from not enforcing too much locality. So um, uh, one thing is uh, resiliency. So if one of these nodes uh, in your rack dies, and remember you didn't buy the most expensive machine, these nodes are going to go down maybe one, I've seen statistics like at least in the mid 2000s it was about one, uh, if you have a thousand computers about one would go down every day, right? So if you're, if you're running a lot of this, if you're, if you're maintaining many of these racks, um, you're going to have every day, if, if you're going to have to deal with some of these nodes going down, they may not actually reboot them you know, on, until the next day, because they just have so many of these things going at once. And, um, it's, it's not worth trying to rush over there and, and, and boot it back up again. So if, you, if one of these dies, because your data is distributed across different nodes, you have another source where you can get the data from. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so, so, um, so, so also, you know, it, it could be that it just doesn't completely shut down it could be that if one of the of the nodes is especially slow, then you, you can also go and find that same data someplace else, and you can run um, then run the computation over there. So you're really you're going to bring the computation you need to do on the data to where the data is stored. If it's stored multiple locations, you have you know multiple chances to actually um, run something. So why could one of these one of these nodes be much slower than the others? Well, you know, it may be that your, your uh, cluster is, um, is heterogeneous. Um, so there are different machines in different locations. Um, it, it, it could also be that you're running multiple things at the same time. And that 
one of those nodes has another job which is very consuming on it. So you're going to um, move the computation off of that node um, and to another node that already has the same data. Um, or it, it could be that just that node hasn't quite crashed, but something's gone wrong with it, and there, for some reason it's a lot slower than it should. And you know, when you have lots and lots of machines, this will happen someplace. You don't want to have to wait for that last machine. We will actually, um, I'll show a little bit more about this idea of this last reducer, the curse of the last reducer, and we'll spend kind of a lecture on ways of actually how to deal, kind of design your algorithms to deal with this. Um, and so, I haven't really lost, the last point is, you know, I haven't really lost all of the, um, um, I haven't really lost all of the locality. I still have these 64 megabyte blocks. And this is often still um, enough locality to do certain sort of operations. And the, the locality I don't have and how the data is stored, I'm going to gain by running this map this process. So essentially the map process will be something that will allow me to regain the locality I don't have and how the data is initially stored. Um, so so the, the last point I want to make about the file system is that it's, it's often assumed that the data is not really changing a lot. You have the data already stored on this file system, and it's there, and you're maybe, your you're, only thing you're doing is maybe you're appending things. Very rarely do you go back and actually even change something, or, um, or delete something from the data, you're only adding to it. Um, and so, you, you, at, the, at the start of computation, you know, people think, okay, I, yeah, I need to go and um, look at the cost of sending the data out to all the machines. And when we're talking about GPUs, you'll actually need to care about this cost. It takes time to pull the data onto the GPU processor. Here, the data is already there. You're assuming you have this data here, and you're going to be running lots of different operations on it at different times. And, um, and, and so you're not thinking of moving this data. It's already there. And this Google file system or Hadoop file system is keeping it, it uh, in a way that's distributed and replicated. But you don't really have control over which things are next to each other outside these 64 megabyte blocks. Okay. All right, so, so now that we have this, this file system, and I'm gonna um, kind of uh, conceptually draw this here, as just, you think of it just as these key value pairs, and you don't really have control over um, how these are distributed, but you have this large block of them, and now you're going to do um, some you're thinking of designing some, some uh, program which runs in parallel on each of the key value pairs. And it runs in these kind of two main steps. So the first step is going to take each key value pair and it's going to run this map step, which is going to somehow create um, a new set of key value pairs. And we'll, we'll go through some examples of this. Um, and the, the, the important thing is it has some, the value part will be the content. And the key will be used to, to regain the locality about the data. So the, after you do this map step, you generate new key value pairs. There is a sort step or a shuffle step that will then um, aggregate all of the new key value pairs where the things with the same key are going to end up on the same computer okay, into, into, a, into a separate task. And this, the input to this will be the reducer, will, will be the, 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 all the, all the key value pairs with the same key will wind up on the same reducer. And then this reduce process will, will look at all the, the key value and everything that's, that, and all the values that have been associated with that key and do something on them. And it's going to write them uh, back out onto this, onto this Google file system. OK, so um, you're going to start with all the data in the file system you're going to somehow create these, these keys, which are going to be able to read, um, to bring locality, some sort of important data that you want to compare to each other, next to each other. It's going to send it to new machines, which are going to then um, run this reduce step and do some sort of processing on this data grouped by these keys. And you're going to write it back out to this. OK? Um, so and then. Each round, it, it's, 
it's, it's going to write it out to disk, and then you can repeat this if you want. So often you want to do computations in some small, small number of rounds. There's, there's a fair bit of overhead associated with the rounds. Um, and it needs to write, the rationale to write things out to disk is that mean at the end of every round, things are back in, the, in, the, in this distributed file system, and things are very resilient to failure. If you don't write them out to out to out to disk, then you're gonna then if a machine goes down, you have to figure out how you got the data there and maybe rerun um, the map step, whatever map to this this reducer, and then redo the reduce step. You don't want to necessarily have to do that. It's a lot safer and easier to have be very resilient to node failure if you write it out to disk. Um, and so the the, the the, the key thing to think of is you're going from a lot of data you have on disk and your output, this is really useful when the output is also going to be a lot of data. Something that's not just like a single value like the, the sum of, of all the uh, web pages you have or something, but is something where there's a large output as well. Okay, so, so let's, um, let's, let's go through so some, some different views, conceptual views of how this works. So now I'm actually going to steal some, some pictures from, um, from the original paper or the original talk slides. And uh, so, so, so just a different view of how this works conceptually. You have this data stored and you want to do some sort of processing on these key value pairs. And because you don't have control really over how it's stored, you may not want to run on all of the data you have in the Google file system, just some subset of the data. And so each mapper may have a different amount in the subset. And it's going to produce these key value pairs. Right? And then you're grouping by the key. And then all the, all the key value pairs with the same key, key one here, end up on the same reducer, and it produces an output. All the, all the key value pairs with key two are going to end up on the same reducer. And you think of these as a, as a separate task. And these, the, the, the underlying system will group the tasks together on, on, um, on certain machines. They don't, these don't need to be an individual machine, but when we're thinking about, say, like in this, uh, when we're thinking about the, the PRAM model, you can think of these as individual processors. If you have a whole bunch of reducers, you don't need them to each be an individual processor. Um, but uh, you can, if there are two small ones, they can be on, this, on the same machine and run one after the other. And the, um, but uh, again, from a program aspect, you don't have to worry about that. The underlying system takes care of figuring out where all this is going. Um, Why are there two K ones feeding into the same? Um, yeah, okay, so, so this mapper is producing three key value pairs. Two of them have the same key. Okay. Okay. Um, there's okay, another so key, key one. K1 there, B1 there are four. A. There are four mappers. There are four key value pairs that have key one. Two here, one here, and one here. And so here, there's there's key uh, key one, and then there are four different values. And this reducer has to do something given this key one and these four different values. So you can also think of this. So you can think of this in a parallel where. These, these map tasks are broken by different machines, and then it's it's sending uh, using some this shuffle phase is sending them to the the, the appropriate um, to the appropriate machine to process. Where all of key one is on here, all of key two is on here, and and they tries to evenly distribute the back uh, evenly distribute the load, and that's done by the underlying system. The programmer does not have to worry. We have to tweak the algorithm a little bit to avoid having uh, network congestion at the end. As the map phase starts to clear, and we're trying kind to of set up for the next release round. The the system will try and take care of that for you. Okay. Um, it's, there's some algorithm design that needs to go on to make sure, to try and reduce the total amount of traffic. Because if you're the algorithm tells you to send it, you'll have to send it, and the more traffic you have, the longer it will take. Right? But the, the, the MapReduce system will try and optimize the, the traffic for you. Okay, so, so here's kind of 
this, to answer your question, you can view this kind of as a as, as a pipelining. This is this is built into the system, where um, you think of these workers as as, as as machines. There's one master node which is controlling how this work is distributed, and it runs the first map job, and when it finishes that, it runs runs another one, and as soon as this one is done, it's it, it's the pipeline sends it to another worker, which is then starting to read it. And when all the important stuff is read, so it needs to make sure it has all of the values associated with each key. So once it is done reading, then it can reduce. So it needs to wait to make sure it's read. Um, there are some ways you can do this, which I don't believe was in the original system, where you can run a streaming job on here. So we're using the streaming techniques uh, to actually process things as they come in. You say, I'm allocating um, this worker is in charge of these keys, and I'm say I'm running, uh, have, have a running sum for each of the keys as they come in, I can process it. Um, so, this, so doing it this way can be more efficient. You don't necessarily need to wait in these gaps where you're, where you're done reading this first one, you can already process the data associated here before having to, to so you don't have to wait to start the reviews until the very end. Um, but for, for this is not as as robust to this is not as resilient um, to node failure. Um, the, 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 there are ways you can you can um, or you can make it as resilient, but it's a bit more complicated. But um, it's it's not going to save that much time. Most of the time is in here. Okay. So so here's another. Um, so I, I I believe this was a a GUI from the original MapReduce system. It's, um, that was running inside Google. Um, and so, so this is kind of a, an illustration. They're running this on, on 5,000, I mean 500 different machines, it looks like. And so the green is, is the map test. And as these map tests, this is the percentage of them that's been completed. And then you can start running the reading in the, in the background. So as soon as you've written out something with the map task, you can start sending it to where it needs to go. And the um, and then with the appropriate machine will be reading it. This is the, the completion is done, there's only a small lag. And then once the reading part has been done, so usually the mapping is pretty uniform. Because um, you can the usually the data is, is fairly well distributed and the and the master can, can balance the load using the replicated things pretty well. Um, but when you get to the, once the reading is done, you start doing these reducers, and these do not run at, as consistent as, as, the, as the other parts. So you know, some of these um, reducers are running faster than others, and what happens is you don't really have to worry about the ones running faster. At some point now, it looks like 80% of them have finished, and there are some small ones which are, which are still running. And you're going to keep running, and now there looks like there are two little red lines here which are left. And you keep running, and there's still one little red line. And the final algorithm is not done until this very last one finishes. Right? So, so this is known as, um, as the last reducer. So the, 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 when you're designing algorithmic techniques, you really need to worry about so that you don't have too much things um, going to one of the reducers because the whole algorithm won't finish until this one's done. Um, okay. Is it, do any of the implementations um, start looking for uh, reducers that are lagging a little bit and calling them and seeing if, if some of their work could be uh, transferred to somebody else? Yes, that's what this slide is about. Actually. Oh, okay. So, uh, so, so the, this master node will be, um, in, towards the end of the execution, it will be pinging the nodes which are still running. And, and, um, and when things are taking a long time, it will automatically run um, some backup copies. It will, if need to, it will resend the data to another node which is completed. Um, and then if there are two reduced tasks running on, on, on separate nodes, it will take whichever one is the first complete. And then it will tell the you know it will tell the other one to stop and it it can 
read that message whenever it's able to. Um, so it, it could be a node has gone down. And so this is all done by the master node. Um, so so, um, so th th this is all done behind the scenes. So as a programmer, you, you, this is not something you really have to, have to worry about. The, the, the master node can deal with when a node crashes or a node goes very slow, it can redistribute the computation to other nodes which are finished. And this can really get the whole process to finish faster. Um, if th this makes it very resilient to individual of the worker nodes going down, but not necessarily the, the master node goes down. But there's a lot fewer master nodes than there are worker nodes, so they go down a lot, a lot less often. And maybe you'd spend more on the master node to make sure it was uh, higher quality parts. You're going to be a little bit more careful about this. There's some algorithmic things that if one reducer just has too much data, it's going to take too long, then replicating it is not going to help. So this can't, so you need to be careful about some things from an algorithm perspective. Uh, but for anything that has to do with the, the hardware, the, 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 the system behind the Mac reducer or Hadoop is going to handle this for you. So why did the processing fail within the RAM? Well, because we have dependencies, right? So let's say that one mapper fails, okay. then the master knows is going to say, run again, right? It will tell, it will, it will look at, the, the master node knows which of the blocks that that mapper was passed to, mm -hmm. and it will tell that mapper to, to run again. If that mapper is not responding, it may actually um, mm -hmm. tell other, other worker nodes that have the same blocks stored on them because they're replicated to go in and do those tasks for them. Okay, and then when map is, let's say map is done, and then data gets sent to reducers, right? Then reducer can retrieve the data from different machines. And let's say that, that one of the, the, the reducers dies, right? Yeah. So then the master has to again check, um, she has to find another reducer and send all the data from all the different machines back to you guys. Yeah. And, and repeat it. And let's say that in the reducing step, reducer fails and a mapper fails. So then you have to repeat the whole step again. So you all. I, I know this rarely happens, or almost. I mean, when it happens, so basically, just because of what, basically two machines, because two machines fail, you have to repeat the whole run. I mean, the others have to wait for the whole run. No, so the, 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 this is part of the reason why the, the assumption of blocking this, of breaking this down to blocks and the key value pairs, where you, you don't need to redo the computation that you've already done. That's, that was run successfully. It's been, it's been discretized into these very small pieces. And if, if you're running, if, let's, let's look at a picture, right? So if, um, let's say if this node goes down and it produced these, um, th these things with key one and key two, okay? okay? So now- They're only the, in RAM, right? They're not in these- Oh uh, yeah, so it's, these, these are, the, it's, it's not generally written to disk yeah. in between the shuffle. If you send too much to one machine, it will try and back up the bits, but you try and avoid that. Hopefully your RAM is big enough. Yeah. So, so, so these, um, so if they, so now this only affected key one and key two here, okay? So this, this, uh, this reducer had key two, um, key four, and key five. Let's say this one six, completed successfully. Because key four and key five were unaffected by here, um, that, that these two parts of the computation are finished and we're okay. Yeah. I don't have to redo them, mm -hmm. right? And let's say this also node, node went down and lost key one and key three. Well, now I need to go back and retrieve key three from this, this node and that node and key one from here, mm -hmm. so I need to go. But the, the amount of, of work I have to do is only the ones with these, the, these key values. Right. Yeah. I don't have to resend all the information. Yeah, but you still have to do the whole run just for these key values. Um, yeah, right. You still have to do the whole round, but if you look at if you look at this runtime, most of the or even this picture, a lot of the time is in this this phase of the shuffle, right? And, and I don't need to resend, even though I have to redo, I have to rescan over the data um, in the mapper phase to find the right keys. I only need to send 
the, the data associated with the keys that were lost. Okay, and so the, the, this, this shuffle phase, um, the sending of the data, I have to send a lot less data than I did before, so th this phase is not going to take us over. So, this, so it's not, so the, look, the, so this is not in the same model of, of this HPC computing where you want to get the absolute fastest runtime. It says, if I'm, if I'm slower by a factor two, you know, really not that big a deal as long as these nodes going down does not cause all the system to crash. So, so they're willing to go a little bit slower and as long as it finishes, right? They want to be able to run the job and not worry about how dealing with all the hardware. It's, it's abstracting away all the, everything dealing with the hardware for you. And maybe it's a little bit slower, but you know, that's, they can just throw more machines at it and there's going to be some constant amount of time you need to spend per round um, but you can really parallelize these, these massive things, especially if you break it up and store things as these key value pairs in these small, small blocks. So heterogeneity uh, extends even to the point that some machines might be max and others might be uh, three x or i386 machines and some of them might be uh, x8664 machines. Yeah, so you would probably need to compile this code snippet on, on, on each of them or something, but that it should be code that is can run across the conditions. Right, and it, should be fun. It, it gives the uh, uh, data center admin the option of yes. gradually swapping in a new architecture. We don't have to bring the whole data center down that's right. and replace every machine at once. That's right, and that's typically how the architectures work. So they, they, they'll probably try and keep consistent things that are easier to maintain, fewer numbers of types of machines, but, but they can easily add in different sorts of machines. The, the initial runs of this, I think, were on fairly heterogeneous machines. Do we, uh, I went to a conference a while back about MapReduce, and they were saying that the, the buffers that are receiving these the information from the mappers, they have like a threshold after which like they'll start to spill out. And, and so yeah. there are these kind of, there are these kind of, uh, these ways that they've kind of built in so to keep it from crashing, like, and so that that yes. these things have to So it'll have a buffer in memory as it's as it's getting the the stuff in the, in the shuffle phase, and if that mm -hmm. fills up, typically the simplest thing is to write it out to disk in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Or th this is another reason why you may want to be running a streaming reducer on um, mm -hmm. if you can. That way, as data comes in, you can process it immediately. And start start writing it out. You don't have to store. You, you don't have to wait until all the data gets there before you process it. Um, now, if it crashes partway through, you need to start over again. Um, but mm -hmm. most still, you know, if you crash one out of a thousand machines crashes in a day. If you're running one thing for an hour, that means one out of um, twenty-five um, thousand machines. That's still a pretty small number. So. You know, don't worry, don't factor in the time lost on a crash so much. It's still a small fraction of your, your overall overall runtime. But you want to be resilient to it in case it does happen. So you don't have to rerun um, whole things from, from the beginning or, you know, spend too much time on checkpointing the, you know, complicated checkpoint of the, of the calculations. And this, this restricted format forces you essentially to checkpoint after every run. Uh, so it's a breaking up the, of the process. So these are, I believe, th this isn't completely explained. This is from the slides of the original map of this paper. But I believe there are 500 machines, and each machine is doing several tests. Um, and it probably has some OS which is swapping between them or something. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, it's kind of just a visual conceptual illustration of what's going on. Um, okay. Um, what question? If I, I, I'm picturing just the way things naturally tend to vary, some uh, of the reducers are going to get unusually large uh, loads from yeah. time to time. Has anybody thought of ways of saying if this if reducer X is um, uh, is lagging, then we're going to take one say one-third of the data uh, that was 
sent to it and send one third to each of three other reducers and see if three reducers can run in parallel uh, faster than. So, so that is, is, is what it actually does. Okay. If one of the re at, at the end, you'll have most of the reducers will be finished. So a small number will still be running. You will, and, and if that is because the machine is slow, um, or if it has too many tasks, you can redistribute the tasks. The problem could be there's one big reduced task itself that you can't split um, based on the the, 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 the the master node doesn't know how to split the node because the, the code says take this really big task and do this. This one task is going to take a long time. That you can't really help um, from the system perspective. From the algorithm design perspective, you can do something about it. And I'll mention one other trick you can do in, in an example shortly. You can just go through the data and check what, what are the size of You do one round, check what are going to be actually the distributions, and then yeah. design the, the mapping in such a way that it doesn't happen that you will have one reducer having a lot of stuff. Yeah, so it tries to do this, not spend a round doing this. You want to minimize the number. You'd rather, you'd, like, in the MapReduce was originally designed to only be just one round, and you can maybe do several things in one round, but you don't want to chain them too much because there's a lot of latency between rounds and we'll talk about this in a bit. You, you, it tries to kind of do this automatically. The simplest way is it randomly spreads the keys and this, this does okay. Um, but it can try and get profiles and, and redistribute them once it realizes the size is too big. Um, so it, it, it tries to do that only. Yeah. How, how does it handle the devices? How does it, how does it handle what? Matrix. If the data set is in the form of matrix, like yeah. right now the data has one by one, right? So it's reading them and then producing. Key so the, 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 there's a long history of ways to try and parallel matrices, either in, either in columns or in, in blocks, and you can you can program this into into MapReduce. Um, I've got some notes on how to different ways of doing that, um, but I, I wasn't planning on this way. Going through them, I talk about that in in my data mining class. I do a lecture on that because the page rank operation is really just a big matrix multiply. You have to do it over and over again, and there are different ways of of trying to distribute the this matrix multiply operation. Um, you you have to you, you kind of want to think of each element of the matrix as as a key value pair. The L, the key is the, in, the, the two indices and the value is there, and then split them up that way. Um, but you want to not completely split them up that way. You want to group them together so you can not have to worry about replication so much. And there are certain things you have to worry about. Um, we'll go through other stru structured data examples that, that talk about some of these issues. We probably won't talk about matrices, but I've got notes in my day mine class where I discuss that. And there's some there's this book, um, Mining Massive Data Sets from Stanford, that has like a chapter on different techniques for this. That's a good resource. So, okay, so, so, it, so let's... One more question. Okay. Why is a run so expensive? It's just one run. Because, because it's, it, it, it writes a... It's involved in a round is usually moving a lot of data and is writing out to disk. The, nowadays, actually, writing out the disk is, can be slower than actually, actually moving the data on the network. But you need to, the reason they write out the disk is for the resiliency. So after a round, you can then recover, you can completely recover, because you've written out to the HDFS or the, or the Google file system. Now, we'll talk about, at the end of this lecture, some ways around that. And this is, and there's been kind of some maybe like a breakthrough in the last couple of years of, of a way to avoid so much latency in reference. So, so maybe let's delay this discussion a little bit. Okay, so let's, let's go through. This is um, um, the canonical example. This is like the, um, um, the hello world of MapReduce. So, so who's seen this word count example before? Okay, so maybe a third of you. Okay, so it should be easy. You're the, the, this is a specific thing. Your, your, your data set is a bunch of documents and they're full of words. So they're a key value pair. You have a document ID and the values are just a list of words, say separated by white space or you have an iterator over. So then the, the map phase is 
you're going to process, now you're going to go and process each word in the key value pair and create a new key value pair, which is the key is that word and the value is, oh, uh, um, yeah, the, the goal of the word count is for each word you want to know how many times it occurs in all of the documents you have, right? So, uh, um, so the word apple, you want to know how many times the word apple occurs. You want to know this for every single word. So you, you, the, the mapper takes a bunch of these documents and produces for each word a key value pair. So now for one key value pair, I'm creating many different key value pairs, one for each word. And then in the reduce step, I'm magically somehow based on the system going to have all of the keys with the same word on the same reducer and they each have a count associated with them. In this case, it's always gonna be one. And so the reduce step, I'm just going to end up writing on a key value pair where it's the word and it's the sum of all, all the counts. And I know all of the keys from the map step that have the word, say, apple, are going to be on the same reducer, so I know this is going to be the, the right answer. So in all the transferring of the data and the parallelism is all taken care of. Okay, so what's, what's the problem with this, this approach? What could potentially go wrong with how you design this? If we have uh, the number of words repeating so many times that uh, one reducer can't handle it. Yeah, right. So, so you have to take care of that the same word is going to more than one reducer, and then you have to sum both the outputs. Um, so you could do that. So, so, so for instance, you know, there are these large corpuses where the word the occurs 7% of all words. Right, so if you, if you want to parallelize this with 100 machines, one machine is going to have about seven times as many, at least seven times as many key value pairs coming into it as, as, as the average machine. Right? So this, word, this, last, this reducer handling the is going to take a lot longer than any other reducers, including you know, many reducers one after another. Right? So, so this is going to take too long. It may even be too much to, to, um, to fit in memory. Right? So, so one way to do this is to have an extra round where you send it to, to, to multiple machines where you say, you, you profile and realize that it's 7%, so you also add in the key, the word the, plus some like random values. So you kind of split this up among 10 different, different, uh, different possible keys. And then you have another round where you do this. This becomes complicated to figure out when you actually need to do this. Um, you have to know that the word the is gonna, <coughs> is gonna occur a lot and hard code this in. Um, or maybe, Maybe you could do it in the, in the system, but you, you don't want to put in special cases like this. So there's, for this case, there's actually usually a simpler way you can handle this. Um, you can add this, um, this optional combined step, which will go between the map and this reduce step. And so what it does is before you send all the key value pairs off of this mapper, you can call this combine operator, which is taking all of, these are only the, the key values that are coming from one mapper and it combines them into a single key value pair. Right, so, so now if the word the occurs in one document uh, uh, like 100 times, then you only need to send one key value pair um, towards this reducer. So this may reduce the, 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 um, the number of keys it has to process by a factor of 100. Um, and so then it still is just taking the sum. It doesn't matter if this was a one or this was a value of 100, and you can still run this the same reduced step. And this will, using a combined, the simple addition will take care of, will in, it take care of this in a lot of in a lot of cases. So greatly reduce not only the amount of communication but the the large load that may happen on one of the reducers. There are other techniques you may need to do in other cases as well. Um, one option is like you said, you can distribute among several different nodes and then have another round that combines them. We'll look at some more structured problems where you have to do some more complicated things like this. Okay, here we can do combine because the counts are independent of each other, right? Yeah. So, so now here, here's the deal. What, have people tried uh, storing the original file, maybe doing some lookup of the other to the file? So in such a way, in such a blocks that you, you, you can localize certain stuff, and you can do more than just counts, for example. You can do, you can do much, much more complex operations. 
Yeah, so you can because, uh, because you have all the information on the map. For example, yeah, so so you can do more than just count. For example, let's say this you have a graph, right? Yeah. And many of in, in scale-free networks, right? Many of the nodes would have like uh, just a few. It's a small degree, yeah. yeah. One of them would have really the really power nodes, right? So, so you can just you can basically uh, if you if you somehow if you if you store the adjacency list in one block, right? You can do, for example. Degree in a in a combined in a, in a, in a combined. Yeah. So 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 you can do other things like this. This is this is like the simplest possible example. We'll look at some more complicated things in the, in the following lectures. Why we combine at the radius? So what's if so the, the the problem is that if you're using if you're using one hundred different machines, right? You want a parallelism of a factor 100, right? So let's say you have um, you have a million words in, in, the whole curve, in, the, in the whole corpus. You want the total number of operations to be, um, well, that would be 1 million divided by 100, that would be, um, um, be 10,000, um, 10, 10,000 steps per reducer, right? You need to, you're going to need to process each of these and add these up. So you want each reducer to only have about 10,000 steps. Well, the reducer that has the word the has 7%, so that's going to be, um, that's going to have at least 70,000 steps that one machine needs to do. And so the whole operation is not done until that one machine is done. So instead of being done after 10,000 steps, it's done after 70,000 steps. It's a factor of seven slow. And there are situations, you know, this is one example where it can be much, much worse than a factor seven. If you had a thousand machines, you're a factor seventy slow. Right? So this combiner is pre-processing some of this on each machine. Now before now the mappers, each of them are going to have a lot of those. So they're each going to do the step for you. Right? Um, so, so then you're kind of distributing this this cost of adding up all the does before you send it to the reducer. Okay, so in some ways it seems like the combined is more of a free reduce. Yeah, so it usually looks a lot like the reduce step. And you can use it whenever, um, you know, for a certain class of operations where it, it doesn't matter the order that you process things. Do we that why we are doing mapping also, we, we why we do combined? What is that we can? Yeah, so, so basically you think of running the, 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 the mapper and before you send stuff off, to the shuffle phase, you run a combined phase locally before you send it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'll just try and keep it. Okay. So, so the, the, the actual code for this is incredibly simple. Of course, this example code I found is in Java, so you have a huge, number, huge amount of this boilerplate <laughs> things you need to add in here. Um, this is the, a lot of boilerplate, but actually the part for the, the mapper is you're just you know, tokenizing this long string, and for each for each item, you're going to write out a word in the value one, and then the reducer is this part here. You just have a sum, and you you know you have a while loop over the all the values you have, and you you keep adding up to the sum. That's all you have to write. There's there's lots of boilerplate because it's in Java, and then you need just more more boilerplate here. You specify each of the mapper and the reducer, and you can also set this combiner class here. So I added, added that. Um, okay, so the, the amount of code you have to write for this, ignoring all the boilerplate, is, is really very small. It does all of the parallelism and, and the distribution and the resiliency part for you. Um, so, and most, most programs you'll write in this are actually going to be very small and very, very short, or maybe calling other other libraries or something. Um, okay, so let's give a, a, another quick example. This is actually a very important problem for Google. They they want to look at, I'll say all of all of Wikipedia or all of web pages, and for each of the words, they want to list all of the pages that it's on. Right. So this is needed for when you have a search for that word and you want to know a list of all the pages that that word is on. Um, this is how search engines used to work. Now they they. They do a lot more stuff in addition to this, but the operation will look somewhat similar. Okay. 
Okay, so for each, the input is each key value pay, pair will be, um, the value will be one of the pages. And then for each page, for every word on that page, you're going to create a, um, a new key value pair where the key is the word and the page is the value. And then the reduce step, you're going to have all the words um, in one reducer of the, for every word, all the key value pairs with there are going to be in the same reducer. And instead of taking the sum, you're going to take, you know, you're going to create this set. You're going to take a key. So again, you know, fairly simple to do. Now you have some sort of set, like a list of all the pages that word is. And again, you can squeeze this, this reducer in here because pages will have some words multiple times. So, so again, very simple code, and you're able to do this massively parallel process. If it's, if it's your operation associated with the word is combined, right? What? If the operation that you're doing is associated with yeah, the yes. word is the combined. So, so, so if it's associated, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, somebody mentioned, so this is kind of the core ideas of MapReduce. Let me mention more of the um, related work and extensions and sort of the models of computation. So the main thing you know is there's this Hadoop, which is this open source version. Um, so Google, uh, so MapReduce was around 2004 is when it was published, but it was operational around 2003 inside, inside Google. Um, and Hadoop began around 2005. Um, it was mainly developed at, in, in, in Yahoo. It became it took until around really 2008 where it was really stable and it wasn't, the source code was like officially released around 2009. So it took a long time for this to kind of get going and it's written in Java instead of C++ so it has a little bit more overhead um, because of that. Um, but once this happened it led to very widespread, very rapid um, adoption inside industry and inside academia. People started experimenting with it seeing what they can do and really this is really when the when the field really blossomed. Inside it was a powerful tool for Google, but other people didn't weren't able to weren't able to do this. So even though Google published a paper on it in 2004, it was like five years before other people got to really start start using something similar. Um, so an important thing to know about this and I've mentioned this already is the notion of these rounds in this algorithm. So in the things I showed you, the two examples, they only need one round. And this was kind of the main idea, that you'd have one or a very small number of rounds. But a lot of types of algorithms, especially, say, machine learning and data mining, are very, very iterative in nature. Any sort of gradient descent, like Lloyd's algorithm for k-mean theory, you're iterating with this stuff. Singular value decomposition, you're, you're, the power method is very iterative. Um, so if it requires, often things that they have um, what's called linear convergence, they require a logarithmic number of rounds. This, you'd say, log n is usually very small, um, but if n is 1 billion, you know, log, log n is going to be 30. Um, and this, this may, actually, may actually be a lot. Um, so, so you don't, you know, um, th th these operations don't work very well with inside of, inside macros. Um, so, you know, it really puts a premium on rounds because it writes things back out to disk for, um, for the resiliency. There are certain systems, uh, often in, in academics, that have come up where you don't always rewrite stuff to disk. Um, usually they're, I'll talk about one specific one a little bit later, but often they're very specialized for specific operations or, um, right, and they will sometimes lose a lot of the resiliency properties that makes it um, so widespread in use. Um, Hadoop in particular can have a several minute delay between rounds. Um, and so if a several million, minute delay and you're needing 30 rounds, you know, this could take you hours of delays when you're not really accomplishing much computation. Are the only people using like real MapReduce at Google? It's, it's proprietary software oh, only okay. inside Google. So they don't let anybody else use it? No. So oh, they'll okay. even, it's hard to ask them specific questions about you usually have to ask them kind of off the record, and even then they're not supposed to talk about it. Okay. Um, um, how did they ever get permission to write a paper about this at all? They, they the like to... came from Google, right? So, so it, 
it, so it, it, it was written inside Google and they were in a uh, research arm of, of Google. And if you look, it still took the community five years to develop this similar thing. They were confident enough in that, it, that other people would take a while to replicate it. And they didn't really know the impact completely at that point. Um, they knew it was a big thing inside Google. It was used a ton by 2004. Um, but it, you know, even already, but, um, it, but, but, but it, it, it still then, says something about the open-mindedness of Google's management, yeah. that it didn't just blanketly say nobody talks about anything for any reason ever. Right, right. And it would probably, someone, something would probably leak eventually anyways, people would know about right. it. But after academia and industry got a hold of it, other things were developed and some of that fed back into Google, right? So they, they did get stuff out by the public knowing. Well, it's kind of like the PageRank algorithm. I've seen papers out of Google about that. Yeah. But, I mean, we don't know like the exact particulars of how they operate yeah. their PageRank algorithm. Yeah, there are. Th th I think there are things about Hadoop which it does not get quite right. Um, mm -hmm. People I've talked to inside Google say it's it works much better than than um, than Hadoop. There are certain efficiencies, small little things which they just never figured out. Uh, but Google will use to do for some things that they plan on eventually making open source. So that has actually, you know, been been helpful for them to have it have been developed. Um, okay. Um, okay. So so one thing specifying this round is one of the kind of from an academic perspective, one of the first modeling things, and we'll I'll spend some more time on another lecture on the specifics of this model but that you really want to look at um, how many rounds it takes to complete something. That was kind of the main thing you want to minimize. The amount of communication you could have inside of a round usually was not going to be so much. This really stressed the number of rounds. This was a very coarse model. Could you do something in a constant number of rounds, in a logarithmic number of rounds, in a log squared number of rounds? These were kind of the coarse grained things of this, this model. It had very basic restrictions on not having too much data on any node. But it was very, it was it was, it was pretty coarse. Um, but it, people started developing and formally ad analyzing algorithms after this paper. Um, if if you remember the BSP model we talked about, this is a um, an, a model of parallelism where you process things in these discrete steps, where there was um, no um, no shared memory. Um, we did processors on each node, and then you had a step where you sent data to the other nodes, and then you um, and then you waited until all the sending was complete before you the next round of computation. So this should look a lot like a lot like MapReduce, but this was in 1989. So people have been studying algorithms in this model, you know, for for, for already many years. And so in fact, there is a paper 2011, and we'll talk a bit more about this, um, that says any algorithm that was that was defined for BSP, you can map it in, into MapReduce. You can you can convert it, reduce it to MapReduce. Um, there's this is not the most efficient efficient reduction, um, but it showed that a large class of algorithms could be mapped, and so you could get this as a blueprint of how to do it, and then you would often probably do a lot more low-level tweaks to get it actually efficient on on the side of MapReduce. But there's a lot of this existing work can now be plugged into how to do things inside of inside of MapReduce. So uh, another important consideration is the amount of replication of data. So let me talk through an example here. So let's say you have, you have two sets and you want to do a certain type of join on these things. Right? So you have sets R and S, and they're both the size of about, uh, about 10,000. And what you want to do is look at every pair of items, one from each set, and, and apply some function. If the function ends up being one, then you want to list out this pair. Okay, so this, so you want to, um, so, so, so you have two types of, uh, you know, you can have, uh, um, maybe you're running like a dating website and you have, you know, men and women and you want to see if they're compatible. If they're compatible, you want to list out the possible pairs, right? So you have to do something like this. Um, so so, so the, the first way of doing this is, you can say, okay, let's make n squared different reducers. Each, each pair RS is going to be one key, right? So then each of these is going to be a reducer. 
The problem with this is that you're replicating every value r n different times, right? So the replication rate here is really high. You're replicating your data. And at this scale, you're starting with a set of size 10,000, you're ending at a set of size, what is this going to be like? It's like 100 million, right? So you're exploding your data doing this. This is not practical, right? Um, another option is to say, let's just have one reducer, and we're going to send all of R and all of S just, just to one reducer, and then it'll do, it'll do all the checks. I have no replication rate is one. I'm not replicating anything. But I'm not getting any parallelism either. This is too slow for this one reducer is going to take forever. Right, so there's some, the thing is there's some trade-off you can do in between. And we'll look at an algorithm which kind of breaks this down in more, uh, uses this inside of something, a larger algorithm. But you can instead say, let's do g squared reducers. Okay, so each of the reducers is going to get two groups. So each of the, each of R and S I'm going to break up into G groups, each of size n over G. And each of the reducers is going to get 2 times n over G different things, right? One group from each R and from S. And then it has to do these n over G squared operations. So G is 10, so you have 100 machines. Then it only has to do a million operations, which is much less than, than 10 million. Um, but the replication rate is only going to be 10. So the replication, I'm only replicating things 10 times. So my memory only has to be so much bigger. And so, so there's been very recently in the last, just in the last year this is coming out, some really analysis of if you factor in limiting how much replication you can do, then you can really understand the limits of certain algorithms. Sometimes in order to do something efficient, you need to have some replication. Say a factor 10 here, you can save a factor 100 in the runtime. And they can study these, start to study these trade-offs. Depends on how much memory you're willing to, to spend in, in uh, this replicating versus um, how much time you're willing to save doing this. Um, so often you'll hear people from Google say, if there's a problem, we're just going to throw more machines at it. They'll say, you know, let's, you know, let's, let's, they think, we'll just do this. We'll have, we'll have n squared reducers, really. But you're not only doing that, you're also replicating each data set. Time. So you really memory is blowing up as well. You want to figure out what is, what is the right trade-off here. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so another thing I mentioned is that MapReduce is really um, is, is really important when you're going from many items and you're writing out many items into onto disk. But often you want to compute some sort of simple statistics on your data, right? You want to say what is the average time someone spent on a certain web page. That's a single number. You don't need to write this out to the HDFS um, or the, the Google file system. You somehow want to get this number. And um, so there were, th th these are three different systems in, in developed inside of Google. There are some related ones inside of the, the, um, 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 the Hadoop system. But they allow you to do certain sorts of queries and have different trade-offs between um, the, 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 the they try and not worry about the, um, the, the, some of these queries you need to do several rounds. You're kind of filtering something down to a, to a, single, to a single answer. Um, and so, you, but you're gonna need more rounds in the process. So it's gonna try and keep things in memory without writing stuff out to disk as much. And say if something fails, well, I'll just go and recompute it. And most times something fails will be at the very first step. Um, and there, there are different tools for trying to look at these trade-offs. And, and these, th these are examples of tools where people were trying to do stuff in MapReduce. Like if you look at Hive, which is part of Hadoop, it's really trying to allow you to do SQL on top of Hadoop. It works horribly slowly in general. You're, you shouldn't try and do SQL queries using a, directly using Hadoop. You should write something else which is a bit more specialized for that. And so Google has developed these tools. There are certain things coming out in, in the and the academic or public sector um, that, that try and replicate these sorts of things as well. So you're saying that a, a math reduced task should not be making SQL queries or should not be trying to process you, SQL So people, so what happened is for like, people in industry 
they knew how to do SQL queries. And they wanted to use Hadoop because it was very parallelizable and resilient. So they wrote a front end. And they wrote a front end to allow you to do SQL queries and it would be processed by Hadoop. You know, it ran really slow. It was, you know, you're you're probably better off trying to get your data in some sort of uh, you know, a no SQL database than, than doing that. But people tried to do it. There's there there are better ways of, of trying to do it. And maybe we'll maybe we'll discuss some of this in one day or some of these other, other techniques. Um, but this is built on the same uh, Google file system or HDFS. So the basic data storage and resilience is still there in the same way. It's just a different way of process, slightly different way of processing the data. Um, so finally, the last thing I want to mention is there's this um, recent work out of, out of Berkeley um, called Spark, which is trying to get rid of, handle this rounds problem while keeping, um, making the rounds much more efficient, while keeping the resiliency and the same generality as MapReduce. Other systems had kept the resiliency um, of MapReduce, but they're very specialized. This kind of says, basically, most, almost anything you can do in MapReduce, you can also do in Spark, um, but it will not write things out to memory every time. It'll try and keep, I mean, try not write things out to disk every time. It'll try and keep as much in memory as possible. Um, and it does this through this idea called these resilient data, um, distributed data, where the things it keeps in memory, you might, that machine might crash, you might lose it, but it stores it um, in some distributed way, so using, it, it knows this, um, so you can, um, using some, um, um, using some ideas called lineage, so you can quickly recompute it if you need to. Without having to actually store the data, you can quickly recompute um, whatever those values are. Um, and this allows you not to have to write everything to disk every time, but still be able to recover from crashes with nearly um, the resiliency of MapReduce. And they, they can't compare to MapReduce because it's not open, but they compare to Hadoop, and they reported things like uh, 20 to 40 times speed. Um, by not having to write out to disk every time. So these, these, uh, avoiding all these IOs really has these really large improvements. Um, in particular, for sorts of iterative algorithms that are really needed in uh, machine learning and, and data mining, this, this, these are really important things to do. So there's a package on top of this called Shark, which does, um, which allows you to do some, a lot of these machine learning and, uh, and uh, data mining. And this is much faster, but it's the same kind of flexibility and resiliency and ease to code that you have with MapReduce. All right, so 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 that kind of catches you up on you know what what has been going on with MapReduce. The next few lectures we'll be looking at specific algorithmic, algorithmic techniques you can do to design to kind of make sure things will run fast without worrying about say too many rounds or getting stuck with a really large reducer.